Thank you, Barb, for the prayer. Thank you for that scripture reading. Um, it's one we read at our house Christmas morning, and I thought it just was brought a freshness to the Christmas story for me, and, and, and I appreciated that. And thank you, Barb, for your years of service on the Worship Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for the children's time this Advent. Appreciate your efforts and work with that. And church, just to note, we're going to be needing some children's moments, volunteers, some children time volunteers in January and February. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, contact someone from the Worship Commission or uh, church office. Thanks again, music team. Um, I heard a lyric that I've never, that's never stood out to me before. Um, it was from, it came upon the midnight clear. The lyric was, Oh, hush the noise and cease the strife. There's all kinds of noise. Yeah, there's physical noise, right? But there's also emotional, mental noise that creates strife within us and around us. I was struck by that. Um, Christmas, Jesus' is coming, is also about hushing the noise and ceasing the strife. And thank you, church, for the many Christmas cards, blessings, and gifts. Um, on behalf of all the pastors, thank you for those. We appreciate that a lot. So Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I hope you were able to have some meaningful times during this Christmas. Um, I love this Christmas card that I received many years ago. Uh, and it's just been strong, and I invite you to hear it this morning as well. It's as Jesus is writing it. Jesus says, If you look for me at Christmas, you won't need a special star. Jesus says, I'm no longer just in Bethlehem. I'm right here where you are. You may not be aware of me amid the celebrations. You'll have to look beyond the stores and all the decorations. But if you take a moment from your list of things to do and listen to your heart, you'll find I'm waiting there for you. Jesus says, you're the one I want to be with. You're the reason that I came. And you'll find me in the stillness as I'm whispering your name. May you find and experience Jesus whispering your name, your name, this holiday season, this coming year, and the years to come. In my devotions this week, I read this verse, this is the first slide, and if, I think it fits nicely into our Advent theme of being on the road, and each week we've been on the road for something, and today it's on the road to rejoicing. As you can see there, it's from Isaiah 49, 13. And here's the whole verse. It reads, Sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. Why? For the Lord has comforted his people, and will have compassion on his suffering ones. That's us. Anybody else have any suffering this past year? Mm -hmm. Rejoice. We can draw comfort and strength from the Lord. And as I like to do, when I find a particular verse that's strong for me, I'll, I'll write it on a card, and I'll date it, and I'll reflect on this later. And so I have a, a stack of cards. And a month or so from now, I'll read this one again, and I'll be reminded of the sense and, and, and the comfort and the strength I've gotten from that verse. May you find scriptures this year that speak to you, that you can draw, write down and then draw strength from throughout the whole year, not just the Christmas season. 
So I'm thinking of the Luke 2 text with the shepherds interacting with the angels. And I'm struck by this next slide. And this is the question I think of. What do you think of the myriad of emotion and action in the Luke 2, 8 through 20 text? It's a text that's often read. We heard it this morning differently, but also Christmas Eve service. Some of you would have heard it there. Others may have read it, family Christmas uh, Christmases. And to me, this text, it speaks of real life. We have a lot of different emotions, choices, and actions in our own lives. And I see the shepherds having to deal with some of those things. You know, there's a couple verses here I want to bring out. But you know, the shepherds didn't have to respond in the way they did. They could have just said, oh, that was cool, and gone on with their lives. But they chose to fully embrace what was going on and allow their lives to be transformed. So I love the emotion here in verses 9 and 10. So if you have your Bibles or your devices, and if you want to look with me, I invite that. It's Luke 2, verses 9 and 10. Then an angel of the Lord sto stood before them, the shepherds, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and the shepherds were terrified. Yeah, you'd be terrified too if you were going to work, doing your normal farming activity, and boom, these angels showed up. So I'm struck by that emotion, that fear. There are things we have that make us terrified, right? We have those things. So that's one way I relate to the shepherds here. But I love verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. For I am bringing you good news of great joy for all. Can you imagine the shepherds, the emotions, the feelings that's going on with them? I see, sense the fear in this text, but I also hear and feel the hope proclaimed by God's messenger here. So I'm thinking, so what? How does that apply to my life or our lives? So for me, it challenges me to be honest about my own fears, to name them, and to ask myself, will I allow God to speak into my fears? These shepherds were terrified, and I believe they allowed the angels, these messengers, to speak into their fears. Can you do that? Can you name your own fears? And then hear the Lord say, do not fear, have joy. Do not fear, have joy. Can you rejoice even as you face fear or anxiety or unknowns? Unknowns bring me fear and anxiety. I like to control things as much as I can. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so for me, to name that is helpful for me, and will I allow God's message, God's messenger, to speak into that? So I have some fears. I'm not going to give them all to you this morning. I have some fears of how Heston Mennonite Church will function this coming year and beyond. I have some fears about that, and I suspect some of you do as well. I have some fears. How will Mennonite Church USA function? And what happens with South Central Conference? I have some fears about that, some unknowns. And can I hear in both those things the Spirit say, heavenly messenger say, don't fear, have joy. I have fears for my family or friendships. 
I have fear for my limits. There's, there's only so much I can do with family, with community, with church. Can I hear the Spirit say, don't be afraid. Have joy on this road. I want to hear and keep hearing the Lord say, do not fear. Have joy. And I invite you there as well. So the next slide I have this morning, and the question is, can you imagine the wonder and amazement of the scene in verses 13 and 14? One of the keys about reading the scriptures is not just reading it the same way all the time. It's important sometimes to read the scriptures and think differently. That's why different versions are so helpful sometimes. It helps you think about it differently. So may you hear this differently. May you see it differently. Verse 13 reads, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. That's a mind blower right there. And they were praising God and saying, or singing, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace among those whom he favors. So imagine you're sitting out there with your sheep, with your buddies, smelling the sheep, hearing the sheep, and the angel shows up. You're terrified of that. And then this whole heavenly multitude comes and starts singing. That's not a quiet deal. Can you imagine a hundred Marie's singing? <laughs> Boom! That's loud! And she was even masked this morning, right? And maybe they were singing the Messiah song, right? Wouldn't that be amazing? Think differently. Can you imagine... The wonder. I bet in your life you can recall some wonderful worship experiences, right? Right? I remember singing 606, now called what? The dedication hymn? That's what we're calling it now? With thousands of Mennonites at Mennonite Convention 2015, arm in arm with my family members. Yeah, that's powerful for me. I also remember going to a performance of the Messiah at the University of Michigan in December 2017 with some friends. And the stage was, was twice the size. It was full, of course. So can you imagine the volume of that? It was awesome. It's a beautiful worship experience for me. So I'm sharing some of mine so that you can get some help clicking into worship experiences you've had that have just been beautiful and wonderful that is probably not unlike, in my opinion, of what the shepherds experienced. I also remember there was a, a men's conv uh, Christian conference in Columbus, Ohio, and there was some beautiful worship music going on. And the invitation for these men there were, you know, before COVID, <laughs> but the, the auditorium was full of men worshiping, singing loud, and, and the worship leaders invited men to come forward, to kneel, to pray, to just worship in the front, and the men came forward, and I remember joining that and being moved with that and, and realizing that for many men to show that kind of emotion, uh, they can't do it or they don't do it. So that was a powerful worship experience for me. I think of that with the shepherds. I think some of those shepherds, um, their hard, crusty life, some of them just melted before God in, in this beautiful worship experience. Can you imagine the wonder and amazement of this amazing worship scene. I think you can. 
I think you can. And church and friends, we have to hold on to those and look for when they happen again in the future. That's why I love Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise God, all angels. Praise the Lord, all his host. And then, I love how the shepherds experienced this deep worship experience. And then they acted. They did something. They made the world a better place. They didn't just go to worship and go, man, that was so beautiful. Something happened inside of them. So they wanted to share that with other people. Something good. I love that. They made the world a better place. Listen to verses 17 and 18. When the shepherds saw Jesus lying in the manger, just as the angels had said, they then made known what had been told to them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. And you notice it doesn't say here, they were amazed at what the pastors told them. Or the preachers. They were amazed at what the shepherds told them. You with me? Shepherds, normal people. The church, the world needs to hear your stories. Not just mine. My job is to, to help encourage you to share your stories because you know you've had some great stories. Lives are changed. I love that. My next slide here. The shepherds were not hearers only. They were doers of the word of God. And you see the James text there. Some of you are familiar with those verses. James 1.22 says, be doers of the word and not mere hearers only. And James right, because he's tough, he says, who deceive themselves. He's saying we deceive ourselves if we're just listening instead of just listening and doing. And then a little bit later in his book, verse 14 in chapter 2, he says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works. I think it's important to have faith. I think it's important to do good works, make the world a better place. But I think it's best to have both. Can a brother get an amen? amen. Both are good. So I ask you, how can you be a doer in 2021? And not just a hearer. Now, I'm not just saying more, okay? Because I think sometimes we, we have this feeling from church or, or, or organizations, we just want more of you, more of your time, more of your money, more, more, more. I think what I'm asking the question is, what is the spirit churning in you, in your response to your worship, in response to God's message to you. What makes you come alive? Also, what in good conscience? It's like, I can do that. Now, doesn't mean you do everything. That's not what I'm saying. But I think there's a point where I can do this, and it's healthy to say, but I can't do this. I can do this, but I can't do this. Sometimes we get pushed and we get challenged to do things. We're not comfortable with, but you have to know if you have the capacity for that. Church, we're going to need some children's time, some worship leaders, some music people for our Sunday morning worships going forward. We need some people to be willing to do some things. And to be honest with you, it's not arrogant if you contact someone in worship commission and say, hey, I'd like to do that. You know, worship commission people get exhausted asking people to do stuff. It is such a joy when, when someone can say, you know, hey, I'd like to do that. What other kind? <laughs> Ken's over here, amen on the music, man. 
how can you be a doer in 2021? Part of the reason we're doing this constitution church structure changeover is so we can be more doers. Not to say, well, hey, that's a good idea. Let's take two years to talk about that in this committee and commission, and then maybe we'll think about it. No, the idea is boom, so we can be doers. That's what, what I'm hearing the goal for the Constitution is. We need your help. Before long, we're going to need some Sunday school teachers, some Wednesday night volunteers. We always need prayer partners. Church, we're not going to be able to do anything if we don't have people who pray. Some of us can pray longer and more than others. Others of us, we're at a time in life where we can't really pray that much. You know, when you've got little kids all around all the time and you're busy like crazy, your prayer time is going to be less, but it's still worth it. It's something. Hmm. Who is the church? We are the church. So there's lots of things I could say about doers. Be a doer in 2021. So this last slide I had this morning, I'm drawn to Philippians 4.4. And Paul writes, and, and many of you have probably heard this one in Philippians 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. So I believe Paul knows the importance and power of rejoicing in being the church and serving God. I think he knows how important it is to find times and places and ways to rejoice in what you're doing. You know as well as I do, if you're doing things and you just have to do it all the time, it gets kind of old and boring. You're just slogging through. But when you have moments of inspiration and rejoicing, that makes you come alive, right? We need that. And in this Philippians 4 passage, immediately before verse 4, and if you want to turn there or look at it later, Philippians 4 verse 2, Paul's writing, and he writes, I urge Euodia and I urge Synthe to be of this. Those are real names in the Bible, and I'm not pronouncing them right, okay? And, you know, just a little preacher's trick. If you're ever reading Scripture aloud and you don't know how to pronounce the name, just go. Just say something. Keep it moving, you know? Because who really knows how to say them? I mean, there's a few people who do, and then you listen to them. So these two ladies, Paul says, be of the same mind in the Lord. So he's writing to them. He's saying, be united. Maybe he's saying, quit being negative. Quit being critical, because listen to what else he writes here. He says, I urge you to be the same mind in the Lord. And he writes to the church, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers. And then immediately after that, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So I'm connecting the struggle of the work with these women, with these other co-workers. And then Paul says rejoice, because I think rejoicing helps us deal with struggle and difficulty. And then I think Paul writes some other very helpful words in Philippians that I think can help us as we move into the new year. I think they can help us personally. I also think they can help us as a church. He writes in verse 6, don't worry about anything. In everything, pray. Offer it up to God. Don't worry. Pray. How many would agree that if we did that a little bit more this year, 2021 would be better than 2020? I do. It doesn't say here, worry about everything and then pray some, you know? I, I confess, I worry a lot too. So I think that's a good word. He also says in verse 7, 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding or logic or intellect, he says, this peace can guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I think Paul is saying, let peace guard your heart and let peace guide you. Who's Jesus? What's one of Jesus' names? The what? The Prince of Peace. And then verse 8, Paul writes, Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, and he goes on like that, whatever is worthy of praise, think about these things. I think Paul's saying, focus on healthy stuff. That helps us be able to rejoice always. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the shepherds, normal people like us who were terrified when the angel showed up, probably even more so when that multitude came and I believe sang. Remind us, God, of worship experiences where we've experienced you. Help us to be motivated like the shepherds to share our experiences and watch for how you work. Help us to be doers and not hearers only. And help us discern what it is we can do with our life situation, maybe our health, maybe the ages of the kids in our family, with what strengths we have, what growth areas that we can still be doers, and we need some help seeing that. And Lord, thank you for reminders in Scripture to rejoice on the road, to pray and worry less, to allow your peace to guide us and guard us. We need your help, Lord. Bless these sisters and brothers here Sisters and brothers, live streaming. Brothers and sisters who will tune in on the recording. Pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Invite us to stand. Thank you so much, Pastor Jess.